OK, let's try this again. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Dr. Garayas for Anatomy and Physiology 2. Um, this video is good for Bio 116 and Bio 117. OK. Should be sharing my screen. And let us now go to, where's my PowerPoint? There it is. And let's start. So this is uh, chapter 19, the respiratory system. And the main function and the or the primary function of the respiratory system is gas exchange. Uh, we want to bring in oxygen, of course, which is the fuel, and carbon dioxide, which is our exhaust or waste products. Another thing that, uh, and these are the other items that the respiratory system does. Um, we already know that the respiratory system has uh, mucus. It's one of our um, frontline innate immunity barriers, uh, and uh, that that moistness. Uh, keeps uh, uh, warm air uh, in our lungs. And we also need an aqueous uh, solution or an aqueous environment to enhance the sense of smell. And of course, remember, sense of smell and taste are both related. Another thing we need air for is uh, vocal sounds. And uh, we are also going to talk about uh, the respiratory compensation function of, uh, uh, of your pH balance. So your breathing also um, directly controls pH as well. So what's the primary, um, uh, oopsies, what, what did I do? Uh, where is my PowerPoint and why does this keep on coming up? Here you go. So uh, there are three types of respiration and three types of, or three actual locations of where gas exchange occurs. First, you have external respiration, which is the gas exchange in between, or also known as ventilation, which is the gas exchange in between your lungs and the outside atmosphere. Internal respiration is the gas exchange in between um, your um, capillaries uh, inside your body and of course with uh, you know your other organs and of course cellular respiration is the gas exchange in between uh, your cells specifically uh, the production of ATP in your mitochondria remember oxygen is the fuel and then carbon dioxide is of course the byproduct another byproduct if you recall your lectures from anatomy and physiology one is of course H plus which is um, hydrogen ion, which relates to the acidity in your blood. And that's how your breathing is also related to your pH. Upper respiratory versus lower respiratory tract. Everything from the trachea, and this is your trachea here. Let's look at this a little closer. I don't think, I don't think we have a zoom function. No, we don't, I'm not on the small screen, but the trachea, is included in the lower respiratory tract infection, not infection, lower respiratory tract system. So you have your trachea, your uh, right and left stem main bronchus, your bronchioles, and of course the different lobes of your lungs. There's three on the right side, two on the left, and of course your here is your cardiac notch. That all belongs to your lower respiratory tract. Everything uh, from uh, this point on up, that's your upper respiratory tract. Now, they go over the upper respiratory tract first. Of course, your nostrils are the openings, uh, how airway gets into your nose. Those are called your external nares, separated by your nasal septum, which separates it left and right. The nasal cavities are, of course, cavity is the opening, right? Here, or here's nasal septum. Your nasal uh, conche or your turbinate. And conche is like, you know, like a conch shell. There are these shelves that are... Um, that are inside and we showed them in our uh, uh, main lecture. Remember the generalized term, meatus means uh, opening or hole. 
of course, we remember from Anatomy Physiology 1 that on top of uh, the top wall of these turbinates are your olfactory receptors that are connecting to your cribriform plate, which forms the uh, roof of, uh, of the bones of your nose, and that connects directly into your brain. Of course, mucous membrane is pseudostratified ciliated epithelium with goblet cells and cilia. The function of the goblet cells is to produce mucus. The function of the cilia is to move the mucus uh, regularly. Because remember, things get trapped in the mucus. Uh, what gets trapped? Any potential pathogen and, of course, foreign body. And the cilia have to sweep the mucus out. And that's why, you know, uh, when you cough up some phlegm, uh, or you sneeze up some phlegm uh, on some mucus, you really should throw that stuff out. We already mentioned that the air needs to be warm, it needs to be moist, that hence the moist environment, semi-aqueous environment, again, also aids in um, the functions of taste and the functions of smell because they're both related. Here's those nasal conche or like, I, I call them shelves, uh, um, but a conch shell, you know how it like, uh, how it has a lip like that? So these shelvings here is, you know, uh, passageways or meatus, and this is your uh, nostril, also known as your nares. You also have holes up here in your skull, and those are your sinuses. Those are part of your um, uh, upper respiratory tract. Here's another sinus here. You have your oropharynx, you have, uh, this is your uh, pharynx or throat, the laryngopharynx is here in this area, and all the way down here is your trachea. Trachea is a more anterior tube, and that is your windpipe, and the posterior tube back here, right, which is, uh, uh, which can expand, and that is, of course, your food tube, which is your esophagus. You have here the epiglottis right here. This, of course, is your tongue. Sinuses, air-filled spaces, there's several of them, and they reduce weight of your skull, they resonate voice. Um, uh, and, of course, it has a mucous membrane laying, so when it gets infected, you get sinusitis, and that's when, you know, you have uh, blockage, it has pressure, your head feels like a bowling ball, you have a headache, and also your voice sounds funny. Uh, and your hearing will sound funny as well because you also hear through bone conduction and if it's all full of, uh, you know, um, serous fluid or, 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 or even pus uh, on a serious infection, a uh, serious sinusitis infection, um, that will cause some problems. Here is a nice view right here of your uh, sinuses here, is your frontal sinus your sphenoid sinus here. There are different parts of your throat, and we already learned this in um, our gastrointestinal slash alimentary uh, tract, your nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. Your larynx, or your voice box, there are three cartilages of importance there, your largest one being the thyroid, this one right here. Um, for the male, it's most prominent in their Adam's apple. You have that floating one right before, uh, right below the thyroid uh, cartilage, which is your cricoid right here. And of course, your epiglottis, which is the flap that closes over this hole right here, which is called your glottis. Okay, here's a different view. You have your cricoid cartilage here, thyroid cartilage here. Here's another view of the thyroid. Here's the anterior view of the cricoid. And you can see the epiglottis is, you know, uh, more situated in the back. The other thing you're gonna notice about your trachea, it's C-shaped cartil uh, cartilage. Therefore, it covers the sides and the front. But if you look at the posterior view here, it's there's no cartilage in the back so that your esophagus or your food tube can expand when eating or drinking. That's why your epiglottis, let's, your epiglottis has to close this area because when you're eating or drinking, um, um, the esophagus has to expand, and um, you know you shouldn't be having air or anything going through your trachea at that time. Within the larynx, you have false and true vocal cords. The function of your false vocal cords is to help close the glottis or the airway during swallowing. 
uh, the lower truer folds are the ones that will uh, um, uh, um, cause uh, what they call phonation, cause sounds. OK. You can see the uh, you can see the false vocal cords here, how they kind of form a little door. Imagine it uh, squeezing and uh, closing off that area, and that happens in conjunction with your epiglottis right here. Trachea is your windpipe, C-shaped cartilaginous rings, right? And of course, uh, they go down. They split at this bifurcation called your carina. You have your right main stem bronchus and your left. The right is more vertically located and the uh, the right lung is more prone to foreign body. Your right lung here has one, two, three lobes. Left lung has two lobes and a cardiac notch. You will also notice that the cartilaginous, uh, the cartilaginous rings continue on in the main stem bronchus, but as they get smaller, to the uh, smaller bronchioles, they slowly disappear and give way to smooth muscle. Also notice that you have a pleura, which is a covering of your lungs. It is a, um, a two a layered covering. Of course, you have your viscera, which is uh, your uh, inner layer and your parietal layer, which is the outer layer. And then of course, the potential space filled with serous fluid in the middle called, your pl uh, called the pleural cavity. Here is another view here um, of the different lobes. You have your upper, middle, lower on the right, and then you have your only upper and lower on the left with a cardiac notch. If you look here, if you look at the terminal bronchioles, there is no more, there are no longer um, cartilage. It is now surrounded by smooth muscle. Here are the bunches of grapes in Latin. It's called alveoli. This is the location of um uh, of gas exchange and that's why lower respiratory tract infections are so dangerous and so important to us because that's where you have your pulmonary capillaries here where there's going to be gas exchange between oxygen and carbon dioxide okay and these are called your alveolar sacs or bunches of grapes located at the end of your alveoli okay Gas exchange, we know this. And again, it has a diffusion pressure gradient, meaning it has to come from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. You'll have a lot of carbon dioxide in your capillaries because especially if they're coming from uh, the systemic because we uh, our, our system uses up all the oxygen and what do we have tons of that we need to get rid of? Carbon dioxide. If I'm running out of oxygen because I used it all up, well, there's a lot of oxygen in our lungs from the outside air, greater um, uh, concentration of oxygen, oxygen uh, in the air than the capillaries. So then what will it do? The oxygen will then go in. Another thing you'll also notice that the alveolar sac wall and the capillaries are very thin walled. They're thin and they're delicate. Uh, they have to be that way so that um, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide can easily or easier uh, diffuse through this wall. Viscera, parietal, pleural, we already went over that. Double layered serous membrane surrounding your lungs as a protective function. And also the serous uh, fluid inside your pleural cavity is utilized for as a lubricant. Hilum is the region or the medial surface of the lung. That's the place where all the pulmonary vessels, pulmonary artery and vein uh, are going to connect into and also the bronchus is going to connect to. Uh, remember the area of the uh, kidney that had the dent in it. It was also called the hilum. That's where all those tubes went in. Well, all the tubes that go into the lungs is called your hilum. <laughs> Uh, your ribs, and you can see doesn't cover the entire ribs, but it's nice and lovely protected by your uh, sternum here. And uh, you will also notice that your rib cage is partially cartilaginous. If you can see all this white stuff here, and it's because uh, we'll talk about it later on the motions of inhalation and exhalation that the chest needs to go, needs to rise up and out in order for the lungs to expand. Here's another view of the 
the pericardium. Well, the pericardium is here in blue, but in green, uh, this is your pleural cavity. This view, of course, is a transverse plane. So if I did a CT scan of my patient this way, this is what it will look like on the screen. All right, uh, atmospheric pressure. Astromen, uh, you don't need to know this, but just, you know, just for your academic edification, atmosphere pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. We already know millimeters of mercury as a measure of pressure uh, that we already know from blood pressure. 760 millimeters of mercury is also known as one atmosphere or one tor. Tor is T-O-R-R. -R. So that means the atmospheric pressure outside is positive. Now, uh, what's Boyle's law? Boyle's law means that pressure and volume are inverse, meaning that if pressure goes up, volume has to goes volume has to go down, and if uh, 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 if the volume goes down, pressure goes up, and it makes sense. Like if I like if I press on a balloon, uh, that means I'm I'm decreasing its volume. I decrease the volume, then the pressure of the balloon is going to go up, and if I um, and the exact opposite. If I uh, um, decrease the pressure, what will happen? It will relax up and have, provide more volume in my lungs. That's all that Boyle's Law is. But the better way to look at it is, is that we already know in the outside world over here. Let's see, can I draw? Oh, yes, I can. Oh, cool. Okay, great. So we already know that the outside pressure here is positive. Okay, so positive pressure. Now, when I move my diaphragm down, when I inhale, and then my uh, intercostal muscles move my chest cavity up and out, just like a syringe, you're going to create a negative pressure inside my lungs. And upon inhalation, positive, of course, is much greater pressure than a negative pressure. So what happens? The air from the outside world, when I inhale, when these two muscles, the diaphragm and your intercostals here, what happens? Air will then go where? In. So that inhalation is an active process. It requires these muscles, diaphragm and your intercostal muscles, so that I inhale. Now, as you're inhaling, the pressure inside here will get increased. So if the pressure is now increased in here, what will happen? The pressure inside the lungs is going to be greater than the outside pressure. And then if I relax, all my muscles and the, like the recoil from the muscles will then what? Push everything and then what will happen? Air will go out. So kind of look at it like inhalation. If I pull down on the plunger, which is like your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles, creates a negative pressure. So then air or, you know, in the case of uh, like a syringe, liquid or blood will go in. But if I, it goes, if I release my muscles and then they relax, what will happen? It'll push down. And according to Boyle's law, right, I decrease the volume in here. That means the pressure in here will be greater. Pressure is greater than the outside. It'll go where? Out. So look at B like exhalation, look at A like inhalation. Uh, so resting, it goes, uh, inspiration, that's an active process. E it goes, expiration is a, um, um, is, is, is relaxing, it's a passive process. Now, another thing uh, is surfactant. We talked about surfactant reduces the surface tension in the alveoli. If you reduce the surface tension, that it goes, that helps uh, um, the lung to expand. And more specifically, it helps the oxygen and carbon dioxide gas exchange inside the alveoli. And that's why we get a little bit excited on newborns who are very premature because they don't have a lot of surfactant and you need surfactant to breathe. Um, you need it to reduce surface tension so that there's a greater gas exchange and of course keep your lungs nice and expanded. We also talked about pressure as well, the negative and positive pressures. So if the pressure on the inside equals the pressure on the outside, that means the lungs will collapse. 
Here's another view of your intercostals, but this also shows right here your accessory muscles. And that's why people who have dyspnea or like COPD, uh, if they have a hard time moving their diaphragm and their uh, their intercostal muscles uh, right here, um, they'll start using their accessory muscles like your sternocleidomastoid and your scalenus uh, right here to uh, start lifting up your shoulders uh, to help you breathe. Now, expiration, remember uh, I mentioned that it's what? It is... Um, it's passive. So when the muscles, your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles relax, there's kind of a, a recoil. And then that uh, decreases the volume of the lungs, uh, increases the pressure. Then the pressure gradient now will uh, be greater on the inside of the lungs, lesser outside in the atmosphere. And then what will happen? Air will go out, hence expiration or exhalation. Now, uh, uh, we'll go over this in a minute. Uh, well, heck, we'll go, um, well, look at the picture. That's the, uh, uh, the one that, uh, that was posted online. Or if not, look up respiratory volumes and capacities, and you'll find a, uh, a picture of these waves and these colored boxes. And I want you to look at it first, look at it as uh, basic first. And the basic one is your tidal volume which is, you know, how your airs naturally and quietly move in and out of your lungs as you're passively breathing. Then you have your inspiratory reserve volume, which is your IRV, and your expiratory reserve volume, which is your ERV. Your inspiratory reserve volume is the maximum amount of air that you ask when you ask your patient, you know, when they're in the, um, they're in the machine, it's called spirometer, when you ask them to inhale as much as they possibly can. Expiratory reserve volume is the exact opposite. You ask your patient to exhale as much as they can, and that's the volume there. Now, it goes, uh, even though you, uh, you exhale as much as you can, there's always going to be um, extra uh, volume left in your lungs, about a little over a liter, and that's called your residual volume. Now, your vital capacity is your tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, and your ERV all together. You see this little formula here? And I find it better if you look at that, um, um, that little picture. Your inspiratory capacity, of course, is anything that has to do with inspiration, which is what? Your tidal volume and your inspiratory reserve volume. Your FRC, which is your functional residual capacity, is, of course, your ERV, your expiratory reserve volume, plus your residual volume. And then, of course, all of these put together is your total lung capacity. And for an adult 70 kilogram male, it's anywhere from like 5,500 to uh, uh, 5,500 to 6,000 ml or cc's or about six liters, give or take. Dead spaces. Now, it's not like dead, but anything that does not uh, do gas exchange is considered a dead space. So anatomic dead space is uh, everything except the alveoli because we know the alveoli is where gas exchange occurs. So your trachea is considered anatomic dead space. Your bronchus, your bronchioles are considered uh, anatomic dead space because they do not um, uh, get involved in actual gas exchange. Only the alveoli do. Now, what's alveolar dead space? Well, in reality, not all alveoli are up and running. Some of them are damaged. Some of them just don't function. Uh, and that's called alveolar dead space. You take the anatomic dead space and the alveolar dead space together, and that's called physiologic dead space. Uh, but all intents and purposes, anything that's dead space is anything in your respiratory system that does not, can, does not directly perform gas exchange. So it's all the gross anatomy structures except the alveoli, okay? Non-respiratory movements. The best thing is this uh, chart. Of course, coughing, think about clearing lower respiratory. And these are all, a lot of these are reflexes, meaning that they, they, they do not require the brain. 
uh, sneezing clears upper respiratory. Uh, uh, laughing it could express happiness, it could express sadness. Um, and uh, you know it's hard to uh, manually fake a laugh, but yeah, you could. Same thing with crying. That's why we have actors. Uh, hiccuping. We don't know the function, but uh, we suspect it's some sort of uh, glottal spasm. And remember we talked about spasms. They're just sometimes wherever you have muscles, whether it be skeletal or otherwise, they contract non-rhythmically non for no reason. And hiccuping is one of those things. Yawning as well. Um, there are some hypotheses. People used to think that yawning increases um, oxygen carrying capacity or increases the amount, of, like if you're sleepy, the amount of oxygen intake you have, but they measured it, it doesn't. So we don't really know uh, what yawning does either. And of course, speech, right? That's a non-respiratory uh, air movement, but of course it's communication and whatnot. Now, the brain, who controls the breathing in your brain? Well, here are your main respiratory areas, your medullary respiratory area, which is comprised of your VRG and your DRG. Your VRG is the ventral respiratory group. It sets a basic rhythm of breathing. Your, base, your basic rhythm of breathing or normal rhythm of breathing is anywhere from 12 to 20 breaths per minute. But what the dorsal respiratory group does, it modifies the activity of the ventral group when needed. Your PRG or your pontine respiratory group goes, um, messes with your rhythm of breathing by limiting, limiting the duration of inspiration. So it's a little bit more specific uh, intervention of your VRG. But it's your VRG sets the rhythm, the DRG uh, modifies that rhythm, and that's your medullary, and the pontine modulates uh, the VRG uh, by limiting the duration of uh, your inspiration. Partial pressures. Now, partial pressures are, um, you have a whole bunch of pressures that, uh, and a whole bunch of gases in, in your system. And when we say things like partial pressure of oxygen or PO2, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, we're, we're talking only about that part of all the gases that are mixed up in, in, um, in your lungs or in your system. So you'll see stuff like PO2, PaO2, which is the arterial pressure of, uh, partial pressure of oxygen, and PCO2. H plus, of course, is the concentration of, uh, uh, of the hydrogen ion. And chemically, they write it like this with the brackets. And if you see H plus, I want you to think acid. Remember from last term, a lot of H pluses equals something that's acidic. Okay. Uh, now, I mentioned in lecture, most people think that uh, your breathing is controlled by your oxygen. It is not. It's controlled by, uh, of course, your brain, but your brain uh, monitors this, PCO2 and H plus. So that's also another reason to link CO2 and H plus together. And we're gonna talk more about that in a second. Water and uh, carbon dioxide uh, produce this, carbonic acid. And because of this little relationship, H plus and CO2 are directly linked to each other. So the more you exhale, the more you get rid of H plus. So if you, the more CO2 that's in your body, the more H plus, the more H plus, the more acidic you are. Okay. So let's talk about how that's related to um, breathing and pH. So let's say, let's have this pH here. Um, let's make it a different color. Purple. I like purple. We already know that neutral is where we want to be, and that's what, 7.35 7 to 7.45, also known as pH 7.4. That is neutral pH or physiologic pH. So we're in the middle. And pH actually means the negative log or logarithm 
of the hydrogen ion concentration. That's what pH really means. So over here, when it's closer to one, that means there are tons of H pluses. So if I'm at pH one, I'm very acidic. I don't want to be very acidic. I want to be here. Well, if I'm on the other side, closer to the pH of 14, That means I have lots of hydroxide ion, which makes it very alkaline or very basic. I don't like that either. That's too much. Now, if I put OH minus and H plus together, it'll bring me to the middle, and that's what? Water. And isn't that where we are? We're mostly made out of water and we're in the middle and our water is what? pH 7.4. So this is what happens when, uh, when you're too uh, acidic. So let's say my patient's alkaline and let's draw that in red because that's abnormal. Uh, alkaline for a patient is usually like, I don't know, like 6.5, that's really bad. So let's draw a line here, 6.5. So my patient is definitely acidotic in this example. Now, the compensation regarding breathing, what's going to happen? You know that C goes H plus is connected to CO2. Now, in this patient who is a pH 6.5, that means they got way too much H pluses in their in their system. So H plus and CO2 are directly related to each other. So what's going to happen to this patient when I want them to get them back to 7.4? They're going to do what? They're going to start breathing fast or faster. So let's write BPM breaths per minute. So what's that going to do? It's going to slowly nudge that 6.5 closer to 7.4. And that's the breathing compensation. So if my patient is acidic or acidotic, remember that the H pluses are connected to CO2. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to breathe it out. And that's why when you work out, when you work out, you are um, creating ATP, you're burning it up. So that's why you got a lot of CO2 as an exhaust. And you also have what? You got a lot of H pluses. Remember lactic acid um, from your muscles from last term? And it's going to move you where? Right here, closer to 7.4 where you like it. Now let's talk about what if my patient was uh, um, the other side. They're alkalotic, alkalosis, or they're more basic. And uh, what's a bad basic number? like 8.2 that's bad for human beings now a human being can't be one or two uh, uh when they're acidotic and nor can they be 14 if they're alkalotic so let's say they're at 8.2 what's going to be the uh respiratory compensation here well guess what over here, when they're acidotic in the red, you have to breathe fast. But over here, they're alkalotic. They're going to start breathing what? Slow. They're going to breathe slow because they want to retain as much CO2 as they possibly can. And so it'll increase their H pluses to bring them closer where? To 7.4. And this is the compensations or how your lungs compensate for uh, or how they kind of control uh, your your pH. And like I mentioned also in lecture, it's also a neat way when we're on when I have my patient on the mechanical ventilator or mech vent, I can um, I can mess with this as well. Okay. 
take a moment, look at that, because this is the basis of all your, especially the BSN uh, people in the room. Uh, this is the basis for uh, your acid base, um, uh, acid base problems in your NCLEX. Now you have peripheral chemoceptors and central chemoceptors. Well, we already mentioned in lecture that the central chemoceptors are located in your brain. They monitor uh, PCO2 and uh, H plus as well because CO2 crosses the blood brain barrier. So it's all monitored in your central nervous system in your cerebral spinal fluid. Now your peripheral chemoceptors are located are monitor PO2 not PCO2, but PO2, and they're found in your carotid and aortic bodies. Your carotid body is in uh, your uh, mediastinum and your aorta, I mean, sorry, your aortic body is in your mediastinum, uh, associated, of course, with your aorta, and your carotid body is located in the anterior triangle of your neck uh, near your carotid pulse. Don't need to know herring bre brewer reflex, but just know it's a reflex that uh, deals with the depth of breathing. We talked about uh, uh, the speed and rate of your breathing, but um, uh, Herring Brewer uh, deals with um, depth of breathing and, of course, um, how they have mechanical receptors and stretch receptors to um, to monitor, you know, um, 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 your lungs, how how far they stretch during inspiration. Alveoli, gas exchange, we already know that. We already know pressure gradients, again, for the BSNs. Eventually, you're going to have to memorize these numbers for future NCLEX stuff. Um, uh, but honestly, you look at it, right? The PO2 here uh, inside, inside the alveolus is greater. Therefore, it, it must diffuse, and diffusion goes from a, uh, from a concentration of high to a low concentration. So it goes from 104 to 40, and then your CO2, PCO2 goes 45 to what? 40, from a concentration of high to low. So the net movement will be out of the capillaries and into your lungs so you can exhale your CO2. And the net movement of diffusion of oxygen is to go inside your capillaries uh, because I need uh, to oxygenate, um, you know, my, my body. Um, so it can be used as fuel. Here's another view, similar. It's the same thing. Another view, again, similar, same thing. High to low diffusion. It doesn't, and you could also see how thin the capillary walls are. They're only, what, one cell thick. It has to be very, very thin so that the oxygen and carbon dioxide can perform gas exchange. And of course, lifestyle change, lifespan changes over time. What happens to your immune system? It becomes less. Therefore, your cilia becomes not only less in number, less in activity. Mucus will get thick because um, uh, older patients are more prone to dehydration. And, you know, as adults, we don't drink as much, drink as much water. All reflex will become, uh, reflexes in general become slower. Um, we already know from the lymphatic system and the immune system that your immune system loses efficiency and your thugs like your macrophages don't recognize bad guys as much. Actually, there are many times where your macrophages start doing um, uh, start doing friendly fire um, um, because they lose their, they slowly lose their ability to and lose their efficiency to, uh, uh, of course, phagocytize the, the things that they need to. And if your immune system is down, what's going to happen? And your breathing is not as uh, efficient as it was when you were younger. So what's going to happen? You'll be more prone to respiratory infections. Um, bronchial and, and, and you could read the rest and uh, that's typical. So this is the new video. It's a little bit cleaner and faster. And of course, I'm going a little fast, but it's okay. You can pause. So thank you very much. Good luck on your quizzes and exams.